let's uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, again, you're welcome to sit uh, wherever you would like, but just check that I kind of have you on the right place, and if I don't, you can mark where you want to sit. Um, but let me pray for us. Father, thank you for the privilege of being at Bryan College. Thank you for the privilege as a community to interact with your word and what a glorious word it is. Um, stand uh, the test of time and has communicated to so many of your people. Uh, we want your word to communicate to us. Uh, we want to think your thoughts after you and we recognize that in and of ourselves that is impossible but we ask that you would open our minds to the scriptures um, we believe that you're an effective communicator and that you can change our lives and so we pray that you would uh, do that uh, today as we look at your word and again we uh, never are making this prayer uh, claiming in any way inherent superiority over anyone else if you had left any of us in our sin, we would all uh, justly perish. And yet you are a God of grace and you extend your grace. And uh, we thank you for that. And we pray that you would bless us today because our Lord Jesus has lived a perfect life in our behalf and has died for our sins and has promised our complete and utter transformation one day. Would you bless us today because of the work he's done for it's in his name that we pray. Amen. So I wanted to do something uh, today as we uh, go, go through this. And let me see if I can toggle uh, between these two. So, so we're looking at Isaiah 1 to 3 today. And... Uh, just as I remember, uh, make sure to take the attendance quiz. It should be up on Brightspace. Um, and uh, so we're looking at Isaiah 1 to 3 today. It's interesting that um, the material in Isaiah tells us right off the bat that it happened in the reign of four different kings. Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Hezekiah was one of the best kings uh, ever. Uh, Uzziah was a good king who, toward the end of his reign, got prideful and uh, proclaimed himself priest, and God struck him down with leprosy. His son Jotham uh, reigned a co-regent while he was suffering with leprosy. Um, when Uzziah died very shortly after that, uh, Ahaz joined Jotham in a co-regency. And during Ahaz's time, things started to really fall apart. And by the time we come to Hezekiah and toward the end of his reign, there is a national crisis that's happening and Jerusalem is about to be plundered uh, by uh, uh, God's enemies. And so this book is situated in that uh, time period. It's interesting that secular sources, so this is called the um, Taylor's Prism. Um, it's two copies of uh, a historical work and it's a copy by uh, pagan king Sennacherib and it actually mentions the exact same thing that the Bible mentions about the Caesar, siege of Jerusalem under Hezekiah so it's interesting that we have a book and not that we need independent uh, confirmation but in this case we have it and this is what that prism says so this is written in uh, I think it's written in Ugaritic 
and uh, it's written by a pagan king. And it says uh, this, as for the king of Judah, Hezekiah, who had not submitted to my authority, I be besieged and captured 46 of his fortified cities, along with many smaller towns taken up in battle with my battering rams. I took his plunder, 200, 150 people, both small and great, male and female, along with a great number of animals, including horses, mules, donkeys, camels, oxen, sheep. As for Hezekiah, I shut him up like a caged bird in his royal city of Jerusalem. I constructed a series of fortresses around him, and I did not allow anyone to come out of his city gates. Now, what Sennacherib doesn't say is the reason I didn't plunder Jerusalem is because 186,000 of my soldiers died. So it's interesting that um, we, we have confirmation that there was a siege, that the siege did not take Jerusalem, but the pagan record doesn't record why but it affirms the fact that, hey, I was there, I had tons of people, but I wasn't able to take this city. And so it's interesting that God in his wisdom saw to it that we would run across these ancient clay um, prisms and the letters are baked into. So it's like that thing has stood uh, since uh, 700 B.C., so it's... Uh, 2,800 years old, and it um, records uh, much of this same uh, information. So what's going on in this initial part of Isaiah is not that siege. That siege took place in 701 B.C. This is way back 30 years before that. And so what's happening is the forerunners of Sennacherib are starting to plunder the land of Israel. And God is saying it's a result of judgment. Uh, the reason that it's happening is because uh, Israel uh, has rebelled. And he's saying, look, you're... Your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence, foreigners devour your land. It is desolate as overthrown by <laughs> foreigners. And so uh, Isaiah's uh, ministry is in the buildup to that national crisis that's going to happen in 701. Uh, just a few years from this, the northern uh, nations of Israel are going to be taken into exile. So this is happening during a, a, cry, a time of great crisis. Um, in terms of who else is there, uh, Jonah probably was before all of these um, uh, prophets, it's, it's somewhat of a guess, but probably before. But Amos and Hosea are both prophets to that northern uh, kingdom, and that kingdom's going to be taken in exile in 722. Isaiah and Micah are prophets to the southern kingdom about the same time. So all of this is headed out to the turmoil that's going to happen in 701. So what we're going to look at today is the first three chapters. And if you ask me, how do you divide Isaiah? How do you think of Isaiah? In my mind, I think of the first 12 chapters as kind of one section. Um, they all have to do with kind of the same thing. And I'm not sure what to make of it, but Isaiah's call 
doesn't come until Isaiah 6. And that's really odd to me why it's not in chapter 1. But it's not in chapter 1. Um, so you have these first five chapters, and basically in the first five chapters, you have this idea of God's wrath against Judah and Jerusalem with just the slightest whispers of hope. So uh, if we listen to the first five chapters, it's basically going to be judgment, 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 and every little now and then there's going to be a verse that gives hope. But basically it's judgment. Then we're, um, and we're going to look at this next time we're together, um, uh, the chapters that culminate in Isaiah's call, and Isaiah's going to say, I'm undone because, hey, I'm no different from anybody else. I've been preaching about sin, but the truth is I'm guilty. And so we have this really, really, really strange chapter in chapter 6. We're going to take a couple of days on it. And God basically says, I've forgiven your sins, but this is what I want you to do. I want you to go preach in a way where people should get it, but won't. Preach in a way where the message is clear, but preach in a way where they won't understand. That seems really weird to me. And then we have from 7 to 12 the hints of promise that were in 1, 2, 3, and even 4, 5, and 6. Those hints of promises are going to be picked up and connected to a person. And it's uh, this, the virgin will conceive. And so you're reading along and you're kind of saying, well, how does this relate to the Assyrian judgment? We're in the midst of an Assyrian crisis. How is this whisper of hope related to that? And so if you ask me, you know, how is Isaiah uh, divided? I think those first 12 chapters are kind of one unit. And there are two parts of it separated by the call. And so what we're going to look at today is just the first three chapters of that first part uh, of Isaiah. And I want to just talk about the power of God's word. Um, sometimes it might seem that, oh, you know, you need help from an expert to understand God's word. I don't believe that. I think God meant his word for normal people. And um, I think God's an effective communicator. And th that means to me, if you just listen to God's word, eventually you're going to get it. Um, if God's an effective communicator, if God can uh, communicate to us and he's effective, then... If we just listen to his word enough, eventually we're going to put the pieces together. I believe that. Now, I believe that God can help us at times with pastors who can point out something <laughs> maybe we couldn't see. But I think God meant his word for normal people. And so there's power in listening to God's word. And so I want to do that in this class. Um, and I want to try to do it every day. So... I wanted us to do something, and it would be really cool if I could get this to work, um, to just follow along and listen to the first three chapters. And rather than you guys having to put up with uh, me reading, um, uh, there's a really good reader here. And I thought we would just listen to him. I, I think it's going to take us about 12 minutes to do this. 
And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to click it, and I'll follow along with, with him as, as he reads. Um, and I'll click it where the Hebrew is up to so that people interacting with the Hebrew can follow along. So uh, I think my computer's loud enough uh, where we're all here. It, um, uh, so here we go. Isaiah, chapter 1. The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know, my people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evil doers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord, they have despised the Holy One of Israel, they are utterly estranged. Why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it but bruises and sores and raw wounds. They are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. Your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence, foreigners devour your land. It is desolate as overthrown by foreigners. And the daughter of Zion is left like a booth in a vineyard like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams, and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations, I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken." How the faithful city has become a whore, she who was full of justice. Righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your best wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. They do not bring justice to the fatherless, and the widow's cause does not come to them. Therefore the Lord declares, the Lord of hosts, the Mighty One of Israel, Ah, I will get relief from my enemies and avenge myself on my foes. I will turn my hand against you and will smelt away your dross as with lye and remove all your alloy. And I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward you shall be called the City of Righteousness the faithful city. 
Zion shall be redeemed by justice, and those in her who repent by righteousness. But rebels and sinners shall be broken together, and those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. For they shall be ashamed of the oaks that you desired, and you shall blush for the gardens that you have chosen. For you shall be like an oak whose leaf withers, and like a garden without water. And the strong shall become tinder, and his work a spark, and both of them shall burn together with none to quench them. Chapter 2 The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it, and many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. For you have rejected your people, the house of Jacob, because they are full of things from the east, and of fortune-tellers like the Philistines, and they strike hands with the children of foreigners. Their land is filled with silver and gold, and there is no end to their treasures. Their land is filled with horses, and there is no end to their chariots. Their land is filled with idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their own fingers have made. So man is humbled, and each one is brought low. Do not forgive them. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust from before the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of His majesty. The haughty looks of man shall be brought low, and the lofty pride of men shall be humbled, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. For the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up, and it shall be brought low, against all the cedars of Lebanon, lofty and lifted up, and against all the oaks of Bashan, against all the lofty mountains, and against all the uplifted hills, against every high tower, and against every fortified wall, against all the ships of Tarshish, and against all the beautiful craft. And the haughtiness of man shall be humbled, and the lofty pride of man shall be brought low, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day, and the idols shall utterly pass away. And people shall enter the caves of the rocks and the holes of the ground from before the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of His majesty when He rises to terrify the earth. In that day mankind will cast away their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they made for themselves to worship, to the moles and to the bats, to enter the caverns of the rocks and the clefts of the cliffs, from before the terror of the Lord, and from the splendor of His majesty, when He rises to terrify the earth. Stop regarding man in whose nostrils is breath, for of what account is he? Chapter 3 For behold, the Lord God of hosts is taking away from Jerusalem and from Judah support and supply, all support of bread and all support of water, the mighty man and the soldier, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of fifty and the man of rank, the counselor and the skillful magician, and the expert in charms. And I will make boys their princes, and infants shall rule over them. And the people will oppress one another, every one his fellow and every one his neighbor. The youth will be insolent to the elder, and the despised to the honorable. For a man will take hold of his brother in the house of his father, saying, You have a cloak, you shall be our leader, and this heap of ruins shall be under your rule. In that day he will speak out, saying, 
I will not be a healer. In my house there is neither bread nor cloak. You shall not make me leader of the people. For Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen, because their speech and their deeds are against the Lord, defying His glorious presence. For the look on their faces bears witness against them. They proclaim their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. Tell the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their deeds. Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for what his hands have dealt out shall be done to him. My people, infants are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, your guides mislead you, and they have swallowed up the course of your paths. The Lord has taken his place to contend. He stands to judge peoples. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders and princes of his people. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The spoil of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people, by grinding the face of the poor, declares the Lord God of hosts. The Lord said, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks, glancing wantonly with their eyes, mincing along as they go, tinkling with their feet. Therefore the Lord will strike with a scab the heads of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will lay bare their secret parts. In that day the Lord will take away the finery of the anklets, the headbands and the crescents, the pendants, the bracelets and the scarves, the headdresses, the armlets, the sashes, the perfume boxes and the amulets, the signet rings and nose rings, the festal robes, the mantles, the cloaks and the handbags, the mirrors, the linen garments, the turbans and the veils. Instead of perfume there will be rottenness, and instead of a belt, a rope, and instead of well-set hair, baldness, and instead of a rich robe, a skirt of sackcloth, and branding instead of beauty. Your men shall fall by the sword and your mighty men in battle. And her gates shall lament and mourn. Empty she shall sit on the ground. Chapter 4 And seven women shall take hold of one. So may God bless the reading of his word uh, this morning. So... Tell me, what did you find interesting about that? First three chapters, part of that judge, initial judgment of the five chapters, whispers of hope that basically people have messed up really bad and God's going to judge. What did you find interesting about? Or what did you uh, have questions about uh, in those uh, sections. There's, there are a bunch of things that I find interesting, but I want to go down your rabbit trails uh, before I go down my rabbit trails, so. Yes? Do you think God is bringing up Sodom and Gomorrah because of proximity to like what's happening right before, and so Israel might have some kind of reference to that? Yeah, Sodom and Gomorrah is near uh, Jerusalem. It's probably 30 miles, uh, at least where Sodom and Gomorrah was. It basically where the Dead Sea, the lower part of the Dead Sea is now. Um, but I don't think it's the proximity. I think it's the fact that the same practices are happening and even being brought into the temple. So by the time the uh, Jewish temple is destroyed. Um, the prophets are complaining of, uh, I think the ESV says, holy temple prostitutes. And those aren't women. They're men. Uh, they're holy men prostitutes who are inside uh, God's temple. And so it's part of... Um, uh, the reason that God finally says, hey, I've had a, enough. So, 
Uh, what else uh, do you find interesting? Well, you wonder, um, or I wonder, so what, uh, what passage is that? set all these together in their scroll. So uh, pointing out that that word logos there um, is the same word that's in um, John 1, in the beginning was the logos, in the logos. Uh, and in Hebrew, it's just the word davar. Um, so it is odd in the Old Testament that the word, like, uh, doesn't. Yeah, I mean, do you find do you find it weird that it says the word which Isaiah saw in a vision? I mean, what do you find weird about that? You don't see words. You don't. Yeah, you don't see words. You hear words. It, it's definitely something. Uh, it's it's uh, the odd feature. It's like, why exactly is God telling me uh, this? Uh, what else do you find interesting? And I'm going to save this so I don't have to do it uh, again. Uh, what else do you find interesting? Yes. Yeah, it's definitely poetry, or most of it's poetry. Um, and poetry in Hebrew isn't rhyming, it's that parallel. Uh, some people think there's meter in it. Uh, my Hebrew isn't good enough to hear the meter. Uh, so the problem is with me, not with the text, but some people think that there's some kind of meter there as well. But it definitely, all of this, or most of it, is poetry. Uh, and that section with the tinkling bracelets and anklets, like, that is the hardest thing to read in Hebrew. Like, uh, every time I've read through that section, I thought, can I even read Hebrew at all? Because, like, the words are difficult and the uh, poetry of it is difficult. But yeah, most all of this, and w whenever it's set out like this in English, that's what's telling you that it's poetry in Hebrew. So this isn't poetry. Uh, this is poetry. That's kind of why they do it that way. Uh, what else do you find interesting? D did any of you pick up as we were reading? I was going to try to... Um, pointed out, but I couldn't manage all of it at the same time. But did you notice that sometimes when it said man in Hebrew, it was the word Adam? Did, did it, you pick that up? Did you find that interesting? Because like, if we had translated it Adam, and the whole idea of somehow is this like uh, paralleling Adam's rebellion in Eden? And I I wish I could have pointed it out, but I couldn't manage all of it. But sometimes it's the Adam. And so I'm reading through that, and I think, what's the difference between Adam and the Adam? But it seems like there might be something going on uh, there. Uh, what else do you find interesting?
Yes. Three fifteen and sixteen. Uh, I thought, yeah. Uh, so says the Lord God, so that uh, more than in the Septuagint and the editor, uh, which are higher critical editors, have this wonderful uh, kind of arrogant note, I think. Uh, it ought to be deleted. And I would ask, is there any Hebrew manuscript that doesn't have it? And what's the answer? Mm-hmm. No, all Hebrew means. So, I don't know. I would maybe say to the editor, the higher critical editor, maybe keep your ideas to yourself unless there's evidence. Uh, but that's just, I mean, it is just the best selling book of all time. And uh, who is the editor? Yeah, I don't know who he is. Yeah. I think, uh, keep. Keep that to yourself. Uh, I don't know. Is that unkind or is that just mm-hmm. siding with? Uh, why, so why did it get deleted? I mean, did it get deleted from the Septuagint? Well, uh, my hunch is that the Septuagint, they're just like we are in that they make mistakes. And sometimes their eye will glance over something. A lot of times, if they don't understand something, they'll skip it. Um, I don't know. You, Caleb, you've been in enough language classes with me. Uh, have you ever heard any of us uh, students or teachers included translate something where there's difficult and kind of just gloss? Okay. Well, they're just like we are. So, so you, you, get, uh, uh, you get those things. And was there there another text variant, uh, Kennedy? Oh, even this one looks different. Oh yeah, I think it's probably like this. That's a Cathiv Kare, uh, where uh, this is a marginal note and this is what's written. And so they're telling you, or I may have that backwards, but they're telling you, even though it's written like this, say it like that. And that's called a Cathiv Kare, and they'll mark it with a uh, K Cathiv. That's what's written in a Q Kare. That's what's read, and it's the when it's listed like this in the uh, computer program. In the actual text, one of those is in the margins, and it's it's kind of fun because it has a big Q, uh, a kof, and a dot, and then it spells the word, and it's kind of like a footnote uh, in the Hebrew text. All right. Well, let's look at some um, rabbit trails uh, I found interesting, unless there are more that you want to dive into. These are the ones that were interesting to me, and um, I don't know, I'd be interested in your take. Um, We said last time there's a connection between chapter 1 and chapter 66. Uh, The end of chapter 1 is this burning judgment from God that won't be quenched. The end of 66 is their worm will not uh, die and the fire will not be quenched. So it seems like there's some kind of 
connection between one. My hunch is that one is some kind of overview of the entire book. And so you've got kind of the outline of judgment and then the promise of mercy and then ending with that judgment again. And so it seems like there's a connection. So one is God complaining about the unfaithful Horish Israel. And by the end, God has redeemed his people who love him and demonstrate that love through obedience. Obedience is God's love language. If you want God to know you love him, um, obey him. That, that's what God's uh, word says. And by the end, we see that God fulfills the dominion mandate. Well, what's interesting about that to me, and uh, pardon the geeky notes, but I want to try to show you something in the text, and you tell me what you find interesting. Did you find it strange that God calls Jerusalem a whore? Did, did that strike you as kind of like really out there. God calls Jerusalem a whore. This is the word um, in the text, a zonah. And in Hebrew, there are two words for the word whore. This word, zona, is just uh, the generic word. There's another word for whore called Kedesha, which means a holy whore. And the Kedesha is like that whole Canaanite fertility cult prostitute. This is the normal word that appears, the Kedesha word only appears a few times, one of which is, uh, you know that story when Judah sleeps with his own daughter-in-law and he sends the guy to pay, and she's not there. And the guy says, where is the Kadesha? And the men say, there hasn't been any Kadesha here. Uh, so this is the word, but this is how the word is translated. Uh, Caleb, can you tell me what word we get in English from this word? Um, pornography. Pornography. So the... Uh, porne is just the word prostitute and so pornography is the writing about prostitutes that's how the word comes into our language but do you see that in the translation Jerusalem is called the faithful whorish city. city so this is like this word is the word like Abraham believed God and it was counted him as righteousness. Uh, so that's that word. That word is usually translated by the word pistos, believing, or bel believers are called uh, pistoi in the New Testament. So do you hear, see here that it's Zion that's being called a porne? Do you see that in the text? Well, uh, would someone look up Ezekiel 16, uh, 31? I think, uh, Fisher, you might have mentioned this. Uh, 16, 31? Yes. <coughs> when you go through Zion at the beginning of every street and over the high place and every square, you are standing among them. You, you are not like a harlot. And what... What word in Greek is that going to be? It's the same. You can see it's the same word, right? Uh, how about uh, someone read um, Revelation 17.1? All right. The judgment of the great prostitute and the woman sitting upon the earth has many rivers of great riches. Okay. 
And what word in the original is it? Right, so it's the of version of that word, but it's the same exact word. Uh, and notice that that city is called the mega porne. All right, uh, someone read 19.2 uh, uh, for us. So here's my question. Is this, and notice it's the same word, just this is the form of the direct object. Are these the same or are they different? when it starts talking about the great whore of Babylon, is that talking about a different porne or is it talking about the same porne? Because that's a huge decision, isn't it? Uh, if the gr great porne in uh, Revelation is Jerusalem, then a lot of that book's going to be about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. If the great porne of Babylon is Rome, well, that's going to be a different. What has God been calling this city in terms of names of like foreign places. What what did God call this city? Kind of the Sodom and Gomorrah. That's a huge issue, isn't it? And you can see it's the same word. The, he judged the mega porne because of her Pornea, her, I mean, are you going to translate that adultery? Because if you translate it adultery, then this woman was married to God, right? And the woman in one, the city is the fateful city. And just one more geeky slide on. Sorry for it, but making the same point. Uh, who who read uh, 29, uh, 21 9? Who read 21 9? Revelation 21 9. All right. So, do you see the contrast in Revelation between the unfaithful city and the faithful city? And isn't that kind of what Isaiah is? So, it raises the question, at least for me, like the rabbit trail I want to know is... Um, Is there a connection? And there is. Um, I'm doing this off the top of my memory, which is not a certain and sure foundation uh, these days. Uh, uh, but doesn't God, in chapter 11, of Revelation. <coughs> Talk. 
call, call the city the great, oh, yeah, here it is. Um, we'll start reading here. Uh, this is talking about the two witnesses. They have the power to shut the sky. <coughs> no rain will fall. Uh, they have the power to turn them into blood. Moses turned the... When they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit. And uh, anyone who's had Greek, uh, what's that word? Uh, the bottomless pit is called the, the abyss. Same thing in Genesis 1. Uh, uh, and then it says, and their dead bodies will lie in the street. And notice the similarity of this language. Uh, oh, well, I've got it highlighted. <laughs> Their bodies will uh, lie on the broad place of the city, the great one, which is called spiritually, what? Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom, and then the other thing that city's called is Egypt. And what city is that talking about? It tells us. What is that Sodom, Egypt city where their Lord was? Oh, well, I said it, sorry. Where their Lord was crucified. Where was Jesus crucified? Jerusalem. So for me, like, I don't know if God calls Jerusalem, Sodom, and Gomorrah, should, could she also be the mega porne Babylon? That would affect how you interpret passages, would it not? And it seems to me that this is connected, perhaps, with uh, uh, Isaiah 1. I mean, she's even called the mother of Tom Pornone. Like, it, isn't that almost the language of Ezekiel 16? Uh, abominations, uh, evil things that are so bad they make you sick just to even contemplate. Uh, so, like, that little rabbit trail to me, like, every time I've gone down that rabbit trail, I kind of get a little depressed. Uh, Petra. When you were talking about Sodom and Gomorrah and the city of Christ and things like that, does that have anything to do with the phrase to love or have mercy? It's the exact same root, holy. Uh, so, like, um, the holy of holies is called the Kadosh, Kadashim. Um, and so, what people had done in their sin is they had given over their lives to license and they co-opted that word. And so uh, like that Kadesha, there's no like porne part of that word. It just means the holy woman. But like she <laughs> they're, they're calling a holy woman uh, someone who's not holy and God is saying that's how far gone it's gotten. So, every time that I look at kind of that rabbit trail, I get a little depressed because it's like, wow. Uh, and
and, and you think of the whole Adam part of that, who introduced all this hypocrisy and misery into the world? It was Adam. And yet God, in his mercy, he's not papering over the problem. He's helping us see the problem. So in the midst of the, and you probably felt it when we read the three chapters, it was judgment, judgment, judgment. But wasn't it a glorious blessing when we come to 118? Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will become like wool. So it's this promise. It's kind of, to me, it seems like a whisper of hope. And by the end, that whisper has become a shout uh, because God uh, has done it. But at the start, he's helping Israel and I think by extension helping all of us um, to, to see the depravity of our sin. Let me ask this. Do you think it's a healthy thing for a believer um, to think about their past sin? Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? If you were making a case one way or the other, what would you, what would you say? It's a bad thing. It's a bad thing, so make that case for me. Yeah, and, the, and like look at the promises and what are some of the promises we could look at in terms of like our redemption? What are some of the things it says about us as redeemed people? It says of Abraham and Sarah, does it not, uh, of whom the cosmos is not worthy? Uh, in other words, who is Abraham? He's a person where if you put him on one side of the scale and you put the entire cosmos on the other side of the scale, Abraham is more important than the entire cosmos. That the whole cosmos, with all its wealth, all its culture, all its everything, is unequal to Abraham. Uh, when the uh, bride... Uh, of Christ is described um, she's described in breathtaking terms she's so beautiful that she takes the breath of God away uh, when he sees her now if you were making the case for the other that it's good to remember your past sin how would you make that argument And when you think of someone who had massive uh, sin pre-conversion in the New Testament, and who even relapsed into <laughs> sin, someone who comes to my mind who falls into that category is Mary Magdalene. And who did God uh, pick as the primary witness of the resurrection? And when everybody else had fled, who was there? Mary Magdalene. She who had been forgiven much. She's so in love with what Christ had done and who Christ was as a person.
person. She's there when no one else is there. And Jesus, of all people to pick, he didn't pick uh, Peter and John and others to be the primary one. He picked her. And I wonder if it isn't that um, uh, she who's been forgiven much loves much. And so I wonder if it isn't a balance that we come to Scripture and we need to think about what we are saved to, which is uh, mind has not conceived. But I wonder if part of appreciating what God has done is of embracing. And is there any passage in the Bible that would suggest that remembering evil, past evils, might be a thing that a redeemed person does? Is there any passage? Let me ask it this way. Is there any passage that the professor of this class just is obsessed with and talks about in nearly every passage class he's ever taught anywhere. Is there any passage like that that talks about past evil actions and you get the new heart and then what happens? Then you will remember your iniquities and your abomination and your persistent deeds which were not good. And this is all new heart, right? And then what does it say? And you will loathe yourself. I think in Hebrew it's like you will be little in your own eyes. Calvin has this beautiful passage. I wish I had had the forethought to bring it up where he talks about we should be all little men before God. Um, it's a Oh, my goodness. Maybe I'll do it for the one uh, next time. But he talks about that, yes, we are called to this glorious thing, but that you can't divorce that from kind of understanding exactly what it is God did because that can work love in your life and I, I do think that you're right that there needs to be a balance there but I think sometimes we might err on the side of the former and maybe a little bit of the latter might be helpful as well and we see it here uh, God's promising uh, redemption uh, it will come to Pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the greatest of the mountains. It will be lifted above the hills. Did that strike you as odd? And the nations shall flow to it. I want to show you something interesting in God's word. So this is our passage. Um, and who was uh, some of the prophets who were contemporaneous with Isaiah? Do you remember from that slide? Micah, Micah and Amos and Jonah was before Hosea, but definitely Micah, right? It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. And it will come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the... Oh, is that the same slide? Oh, it's from Micah. Okay, I got a question. I'm not sure what the question is. You tell me. What is the New Testament source of Micah? It's got to be, right? Oh, 
My heart is so warm right now. <laughs> that is so much better question than I had. Where is it quoted in the New Testament? If things said twice are important, then verses said twice should be mega important. Well, let's, let's look at the next verse in Isaiah. And many peoples will come and say, come let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion will go forth the law and I'm going to bet, well, not bet, but I'm going to wonder in Hebrew if that isn't um, the word Torah. Mm -hmm. Is it the word Torah? Oh, yeah, you got it. How cool is that? You got it quicker than I did. I should feel mad about that, but I'm oddly happy about that. The law, the Torah, uh, oh, the word of the Lord, is, is that Gavar? Oh, my goodness, and... What intelligent reader question are we going to ask? Oh, my good. You were a minute quicker with that than I was. So, so this is Isaiah, and this is Micah. Now, that's weird. Oh. Is it different in Hebrew? Is it different in Hebrew, or did the Hebrew translators of the English translate two different words? I don't know. I didn't look. And many peoples will come and say, come let us go to the mountain of the Lord. And many nations will come, come let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah and the Logos of the Lord from Jerusalem. What do you find interesting about that? When did that happen? Should we read another verse in Isaiah? Uh, Fisher. I was just thinking that that sounds, it may not be what it's actually referring to, but it sounds kind of like Pentecost. Or it Pentecost. sounds exactly like Pentecost, doesn't it? And then this is the next verse. And he will judge between the nations. And he will decide disputes for many peoples. And they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. And then Micah. I'm interested now. I know I've done this in... Hebrew, but I didn't have the foresight to put the Hebrew side by side, but uh, Micah, he shall judge, which it's interesting that the Torah and the word is being called a he. Uh, he shall judge between many peoples and will decide disputes for the strong nations far away. They will beat their swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. 
So what do you make of that? Sometimes I think studying the Bible is like walking around a beautiful museum. If you've ever been to a place like the Louvre um, in Paris, this is what you're going to experience. You're going to pay for the ticket, which is going to be enormously expensive. You're going to go through that glass pyramid down into the halls, and you're going to start looking at stuff. And you're going to say, that's beautiful, that's beautiful, that's beautiful. And then you're going to go to a different hall, and you're going to say, all of that's beautiful. And then you're going to get into the line to see the Mona Lisa, and you're going to say, that's beautiful, but it's really little. And then your feet are going to get tired, and you're going to say, I want McDonald's. And you're going to go into the basement, and you're going to stand in the line, and you're going to try to pull up the French, and the little girl's going to say to you before you even open your mouth, just speak English. <laughs> and you're going to feel really stupid, you know? You're going to eat, and then you're going to go up this hall, that hall, and you're just going to be overwhelmed. But you're going to say, this is the most magnificent museum in the world. That's kind of like the Bible. Sometimes when you come to the Bible, you look at something and you think, that's beautiful. I don't really know what it means. And you're going to study the Bible and your feet are going to get sore. And you're going to say, oh, I need to go get something to eat and sit down for a little while. But the more you s time you spend in that museum, the more it's going to make sense to you. And you're going to say, oh, this hall is the pre-Raphaelite paint. This hall uh, are, you know, impressionist. This hall is the ancient uh, Greek and Roman antiquities. And the more you walk around the museum, the more it's going to be apparent to you why this stuff is where it is. I think this means something. I'm not ex exactly sure what it means, but it has to be important. You wouldn't have a whole paragraph of material that was exactly the same. And I would like to go back and see the actual Hebrew words to see if they're exactly the same or if they're uh, slightly different at all because that would make a difference to me. But I have to admit, at this point, my feet are just a little sore, so I probably need to go be humbled uh, at McDonald's. And I'm not saying that that really happened to somebody in the Louvre. Uh, I'm not saying that, but it did happen. A little girl, uh, I'm sitting there thinking, how do you say blue cheese and salad in the little girl? Before I opened my mouth, I mean, she was like 14 years old, in perfect English, she said to me, just speak English. <laughs> and I was saying, like, how do you know I'm American, you know? But she did, and she knew that I was trying to imperfectly, you know, <laughs> speak. So I will uh, see you guys uh, next time.